Shalom, shalom. It's wonderful to be with everyone today. We are checking out your comments, and it's great to be here with Dan Grunfeld, um, who is a former professional basketball player, an accomplished writer, and a proud graduate of Stanford University, an academic All-American and all-conference basketball selection at Stanford. Dan played professionally for eight seasons in top leagues around the world, including Germany, Spain, and Israel. Dan's writing has been published more than 40 times in media outlets such as Sports Illustrated, the Jerusalem Post, and NBC News. Dan earned his MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business in 2017 and lives with his wife and two sons in Northern Virginia, where he works in venture capital. Dan, thanks for making time. You got it, Rabbi. It's great to be here. So basketball is my first love also. I played um, throughout my youth and uh, unfortunately stopped at the varsity basketball, varsity high school level. But tell me a little bit about your early love of the game and, and how that was kind of manifest for you. Listen, I, I was born around the game of basketball. My dad was an NBA player for the New York Knicks and I was delivered by C-section and my parents planned my birth so that my dad could go on one road trip, be there when I arrived, go on another road trip and be there for my bris, <laughs> right? So <laughs> quite literally, I was born into the game of basketball and Judaism. I've always been a tremendous force in my life, you know, growing up around the game. And after my dad retired, he became an executive. So I just grew up and, you know, at practices and at playoff games. And so just had this incredible bond with the game that still exists to this day. What what of your Jewish identity kind of was a positive aspect of being involved as a professional basketball player? And what what was challenging? You know, you, you like to think that sports is a great equalizer, right? And in my for my family in particular, and we'll get into this, right? My dad is the only player in NBA history whose parents survived the Holocaust. So being Jewish is so important to us and to our identity. You know, my dad wore number 18 for the Knicks, right? And, you know, for, for high. And so for so many reasons, you know, being Jewish is such a big part of who we are. And, and I think, you know, once you step on the floor, you know, the ball, it doesn't care what religion you are, what color your skin is, what language you speak, it just brings you together. Right. So, and I think that was a very cool part of basketball for my family. Very cool. I don't know if you saw this Stoudemire award ceremony a few days ago, it was meaningful to my family because my son Lev Stoudemire explained his number 32 is the gematria, the numerology of, of Lev, which means heart. And you explained to this whole audience that that meaning, and I thought that I thought that was really cool. Um, so, um, tell me a little bit about the the Holocaust story in in your family, and and how it, how how that impacted your life. Yeah, it impacts my life to this day, right? Because we were speaking about it a bit. My grandmother will turn ninety nine years old in June, right? and I speak to her every single day. So, That's really, there's not a day that passes that the Holocaust doesn't you know affect me or hit me in some way. My grandmother survived in Budapest. She was saved twice by Raul Wallenberg, one of the greatest heroes of the Holocaust. My grandmother also risked her life to save others. And so she obtained false documents for 17 other people, right? So she's not only my hero, she's also a hero. Uh, my grandfather survived in a forced labor camp in Hungary. After the war, you know, they got married, had a family. My dad came to the United States when he was nine years old, didn't speak a word of English, had never touched a basketball. Uh, and so it just kind of shows you like the, the, that American dream story. But listen, my grandmother lost five siblings and both parents in the Holocaust. My grandfather lost both of his sisters and both of his parents. So my dad was born from the ashes of the Holocaust and, you know, for the Jewish people all the time, but particularly what's going on today, right? We just need to be proud of who we are, stand up for ourselves, stand up for others when they're not being treated fairly. And we know what's at stake right? When, when Jews aren't treated fairly, when, when any people aren't. So we have to stand up for ourselves. So well said, you know, you, you're right. It's through the roof right now. If we look at the far right and neo-Nazis and white supremacists, we look at the far left and those who hide in anti-Semitism in a vehement hate for the state of Israel. How, how are you, how are you experiencing this rising anti-Semitism now? And, and what do you, and what do you think we should do to combat that? Listen, it's deeply upsetting. It's deeply troubling, right? So you know that anti-Semitism, of course, is so prevalent. And I write in my book, you know, it's it's one of the oldest parasites of mankind, right? And so where would it go? There's too much of it. And that's a very sad reality. But again, we need to be close as a community. We need to stay stay true to our values, stay true to each other, again, be allies for other people. You know, there's, there's no easy answer, right? This is a an age old, right, conflict, issue but i just think that silence is also an enemy of anti-semitism so for, for ourselves to talk to our friends to talk to others who might not know what the jewish experience is so to educate them 
also to encourage others to to speak up for us and to be advocates right we have there's so many good people in the world and they oftentimes don't know what's at stake what is happening so i just think you know i, I try to think about what's in my control it's to speak up to to you know ho hope that others will will speak up for us yeah so well said so do you think anti-semitism is this kind of its own unique phenomenon or do you, do you see it as connected to other forms of hate I, I hate is hate, right? And prejudice is prejudice. They all, there's like different flavors of ice cream, right? And it's such a sad, unfortunate reality of humanity dating back eons, millennium, century, all those things, right? There's always been people not getting along with other people for reasons not having to do with who they are, right? The type of person they are. And, you know, my grandparents always taught my dad after surviving, after coming to America, never make an assumption about someone always get to know them judge every individual for who they are as a person right because they had seen what can happen when people make assumptions when people judge others right and so yeah I, I think that there's so many different forms of hatred of prejudice of injustice and tolerance anti-semitism is one of them and it's one of the most prevalent yeah one of the ways that professor ellie wiesel impacted me so deeply is by sharing that there's two ways to combat anti-semitism one is directly but the other is to continue to live our deepest Jewish values on the global stage, to continue to combat hate wherever we find it, to continue to stand up for what's just and right wherever we can. So you came out with this awesome book in 2022. Tell us a little bit why you wrote that. Yeah, By the Grace of the Game uh, is my book. And it details my family story, the only story from Auschwitz to the NBA. As I mentioned, my dad's literally the only athlete not only NBA player, but only professional athlete in any of the major American sports whose parents are Holocaust survivors. I always grew up with this knowledge of the profound impact that basketball had, had on my family and feeling, right? I knew that, again, my dad was born after the Holocaust. And when he when they immigrated to the United States, my dad tragically lost his older brother. So there's been a lot of real, real pain, real hardship in my family. But basketball gave us another another life. Right. And it gave my dad an opportunity to do things that he never dreamed of doing, to have experiences and really to have a life in America. And, and I mentioned he arrived, you know, in JFK Airport in New York City as a nine year old, not speaking English, having never touched a basketball. A dozen years later, he was standing on top of the Olympic podium as a gold medalist for the United States of America. Right. And so I talked to a lot of students about about my book, my family story, and if they believe things are impossible. All you have to do is remember that, right? That that's where my dad started and that's where he got. And it was really the game of basketball that that enabled that. And so I felt the power of that and I wanted to tell the story. Yeah, so cool. Um, you know, so the four, being at the forward to your book, I believe it's the forward written by Ray Allen, who is mm -hmm. um, well known not only for his talent, but in our world also because President, former President Obama appointed him to the board of the Holocaust Museum and he had this, maybe still does, have this rich relationship to Holocaust mm -hmm. memory. Can you share a little bit about, to the extent you know, about Ray Allen's kind of connection to the Holocaust and what that's meant to you? Of course. Hopefully you'll read the book, read the forward of the book. It's it's incredibly profound and so eloquent. And uh, I, first of all, I'm, I'm lucky to know Ray and have a relationship with Ray because my dad, who became a longtime executive after his playing career, was the general manager of the Milwaukee Bucks when Ray was a young player. And so I got to know Ray and, you know, he would give me advice. He would give me a pair of shoes. I was like a, you know, a top shooting guard in the state of Wisconsin. And Ray is the star shooting guard of the Milwaukee Bucks. I literally had his Jersey framed on the wall in my bedroom. Right. So I'm lucky to have this relationship with Ray. He's one of the top 75 players in NBA history. People know that, but what is less well known is that when Ray was in college, he saw Schindler's list and he was just incredibly moved and impacted by that. And he said, this is not just a Jewish tragedy. This is a human tragedy. The world needs to know about this because he didn't really know much about it. And he said, how could this be, right? The world needs to know about this. And so every time that Ray's team played in Washington, D.C., he would take teammates to the Holocaust Museum. And I've talked to some of those teammates and they said it was a life changing experience. Right. And, you know, as an NBA basketball player, you have a lot of opportunities to do a lot of things when you're on the road. Right. Ray used his time to spread the knowledge of the Holocaust. So. And like you mentioned, President Obama appointed him to the board of the Holocaust Museum for good reason. So as much as I admired him as a high schooler with his jersey on the wall in my bedroom, I really do admire him more now for the type of man he is, human being, and how he uses his platform and his influence to, to spread love, to spread knowledge and awareness of this uh, of the Holocaust. So I, I can't say enough about how much I respect Ray Allen.
Beautiful. So powerful. Last question for you. Um, so what's your message to the next generation of young Jews who are, you know, growing up in a time period like this, you know, and in, in particular, those who were dreamers like you, who really wanted to rise to the highest level of, of uh, professional talent? Be proud of who you are, of where you came from and where you come from. Be close as a community, right? I think like we Jews know the experience of being Jewish in America or anywhere around the world, right? Be close as a community, stand up for others, you know, who are not being treated fairly. I think it's part of our job to be an ally. And uh, yeah, I just think ha having pride in Ju Judaism, engaging with your family's history, I've learned you know, because I wrote my book, right? I learned so much about my family. And yes, we have this basketball story and this Holocaust story, but we all have stories. So talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents and regarding kind of ascending to the heights and, and doing different things. Listen, all you can control is your own actions. All you can control is what you put into it. So I always tell people, dream as big as you want. Like people should laugh at you when you tell them your dreams, because that means they're big, right? And that certainly happened to me. But then when you dream big, you just make a promise to outwork everyone else, right? So, and and that's really all you can control. And listen, like I achieved some things and I failed too. And that's okay, because there's never achievement without failure. So I always encourage young, young people, dream big, work really hard. And I'd probably say most importantly, enjoy the ride. Smile, don't too, put too much pressure because some, some outcomes you just can't control, right? For me, I played at Stanford and professionally, if I sprained my ankle at the wrong time or none of that might have happened, right? So a lot of it is not always stuff you can control, but just work hard, enjoy and be a good person. You'll be fine. Beautiful. Mr. Dan Granfeld, thank you so much for your work and for your time. And uh, friends, we hope you'll pick up his book and um, read this profound history and uh, the story of this dreamer. Thank you so much. Rabbi, thank you. It was really a pleasure. I appreciate it.